where you see the passing of time. We crowds in St. Peter's Square are praying like mad for the Pope's life. Where moments refuse to die. This is a momentous hour in world history. This is the invasion of Hitler's Europe. And where victory lives on. Plenty of girls are being kissed by plenty of boys they don't know, and they do not care. You can love it, hate it, embrace it, or turn away. Lennon was shot to death late last night outside his apartment building. But it is a past we all share. Come on out here and give me a salute. Big Navy salute. This is where yesterday has a home, where we wonder what it was like back then. Go forward, knights in safety. And not too long ago. His spirit must live on. It's where history has its place and where the past comes alive. The History Channel. The spinning wheel and loom. Simple machines that gave birth to American industry and altered the fabric of a nation. More than merely the making of cloth, it was America's premier industry. For the first time, workers were brought together under one roof beginning an industrial revolution that would transform America's landscape and along the way produce material abundance as well as strife and conflict. All part of a grand human tapestry woven by engines of change. The remarkable story of textiles and the birth of American industry. In 1776, a country was born. A spirit of pride and self-sufficiency swept the land. No longer yoked to their English masters, citizens refused to buy British goods. Made in America became a patriotic boast. George Washington encouraged his fellow Americans to boycott English products, proclaiming at his inaugural that he was proud to be wearing homespun clothes. At the time, America was a simple agrarian society, a country where every town, hamlet, and community worked together to produce the necessities of life. Within a typical village, you'd have all the needed skills to make the products that most people needed. Everybody farmed. Everybody raised food. Some people would spin yarn. Others would weave it. It wasn't a matter of each household being self-sufficient. The community as a whole had a high level of self-sufficiency. When it came to clothes, most made their own. A family grew or bartered for wool and cotton. The spinning wheel, a basic necessity for most 18th century homes, then twisted the strands of fiber into yarn. A loom was then required to weave it into cloth. But few families could afford looms. They were intricate machines that took skill to operate and cost hundreds of dollars, a year's income for most. So families would barter their homespun with a village weaver. In exchange for cloth, the weaver kept some yarn, which he wove into fabric and sold for profit. This simple village commerce evolved into America's first cottage industry. In virtually all uh, embryonic economies, the first thing that gets produced are food items, clothing items, and shelter. So it was inevitable that one of the early industries in the United States would be the textile industry. Though Americans produced excellent handcrafted cloth, the output was only a trickle compared to the torrent of textiles streaming in from the great mills of England. In the late 1600s, British inventors had built textile machines that seeded their industrial revolution 
helping make England the wealthiest nation on earth. Workshop to the world. To ensure its industrial dominance, in 1695, Parliament passed laws protecting textile technology. But no laws could stop a 21-year-old from booking passage for America. Our textile industry really got started because of an industrial spy. His name was Samuel Slater. He was a young man who had worked for seven years in the textile industry in Great Britain, knew how to manufacture the machines, and so stole that in his mind and brought those blueprints uh, with him to the United States, where he quickly was able to attract the capital funds to manufacture that machinery here and get us started in the textile industry. When Slater comes to this country, it's not with the idea that he's going to be mechanic or that he's going to build machinery. He's a management trainee who's looking for a business opportunity that he thinks he's going to find in America uh, because he thinks that in Great Britain, with so many manufacturers beginning their businesses, uh, that it's overcrowded and that he would open up a new terrain of enterprise if he were to come to America. Shortly after his arrival, Slater found just the opportunity he was hoping for, a cotton goods business in Pawtucket, Rhode Island. The operation was owned by a stubborn Quaker named Moses Brown. Brown was an early investor in crude machinery. To the eyes of young Samuel Slater, Brown's machines were obsolete, worthless, but in exchange for an interest in the business, Slater claimed that he could design and build machines that would increase profits and revolutionize the industry. He more or less says, this stuff is worthless. Uh, Moses Brown, who has invested years and a lot of money in it already, is not prepared to take his word for it, not prepared to say, well, then I'll just dump this stuff over the dam and start over again, right? So Slater says, well, I think you've got to. In 1790, Slater set to work. He had no plans or tools, only dreams, ambition, and luck. Right next to the mill was the Wilkinson machine shop, vital to Slater in transforming the machines in his mind into reality. It takes a lot to make a machine really work. So Slater drew on the knowledge that he had acquired during his apprenticeship. So he had up to the date, up to the minute, cutting edge type knowledge of the machines. And he had skilled workmen here in Pawtucket that could help him fashion the machine parts that he needed. Critical to Slater's plans was someone who could design and manufacture the complex machines required. Industry in America was crude, technology non-existent. Even a simple metal screw was difficult to produce. But in David Wilkinson, Slater found a fellow pioneer. David Wilkinson was important in this country because he developed the screw cutting lathe. The screw cutting lathe allowed you to take a piece of stock of metal and turn it into a precise part for a machine, like a textile machine. And you could make many of these parts exactly the same way to create many machines of exactly the same nature. The force of water proved vital in making these machines work. The adjacent Blackstone River powered the entire Slater operation. A giant water wheel connected to a shaft was coupled to others allowing the water power to be channeled upward and throughout the millworks. Meticulously tooled belts were then attached to overhead shafts and harnessed to machines. One important aspect of the factory system is that you had one power source, the water wheel, which was able to drive all the machines in your factory. Here we demonstrate how through a series of belts and pulleys, you can activate off of a main shaft each of the machines in the shop. A few days before Christmas in 1793, Samuel Slater's mill was finally up and running. The first shot that would signal America's industrial revolution had finally been fired.
Despite Slater's mechanical marvels, human workmen were still important. Machines had to be loaded and reloaded, cleaned and maintained. To staff the mill, Slater hired children, some as young as eight years old. A major part of the work in British factories was done by children. Slater himself had entered the textile mills when he was just 14. He saw nothing wrong with child labor. Well, the issue of child labor, of course, becomes a much greater concern uh, in the 19th century when increasing competition leads to a decline in wages and real duress for workers. But in Slater's era, uh, in the 18th century, uh, the concept of children not working is probably almost unknown. As later immortalized by Charles Dickens, factory owners exploited unprotected children, forcing them to work under intolerable conditions. Trapped behind factory walls, they were brutalized, some even chained to machines. Days could last 14 hours, six days a week. Pay was between 80 cents and $1.40 per week. For a young child, the task of cleaning and tending the machines was often extremely dangerous. It was very, very dangerous uh, to work in a textile mill for these children who were as young as six years old. Uh, in fact, we have the um, remarks of a reverend who, who, who witnessed the carding operations done by children in, in Samuel Slater's mill. And he talks about their hands becoming severely lacerated by the spinning drums. In mills where they used mule spinning, uh, children were often used for what was called being piecers. The piecers would actually run under the, the thread being spun and tie the broken thread together. And there were some reports of some of those children being physically deformed by that, growing up with crooked backs, with bent knees and legs, uh, because of the constant work under those threads. Yet, as Slater expanded, he tempered his labor methods by hiring entire families. With parents working beside their children, conditions improved and output increased. He began to hire families. And this was a successful form of um, employment strategy for Samuel Slater. It really worked well um, when children worked for the mill and their parents were there too. There was a certain continuity that was there. And um, this is the kind of labor force that really filled this mill and kept it going. Regardless of age, all workers were tied to the pace of the mill works. Like any factory, Slater's mill was essentially a single machine. For the factory to work properly, all its parts, both those of metal and those of flesh and blood, had to function as a single unit. Rhythms of the day were no longer set to the natural tempo of life. What Slater introduced to this country was not only a, a factory system, but it was also a sense of industrial time, which he brought. And, and the significance of industrial time was that the mill owner determined when the day began and when a day ended. So people understood time in terms of when the factory bell rang. They didn't have watches or clocks in their homes, so they had to rely on the factory bell. Time was running out for America's agrarian lifestyle. Each yard of thread produced by Slater's mill brought the country closer to the Industrial Revolution. American industry was poised to take another step as the foundation for America's first industrial city was being laid. By 1810, America's population had reached 7 million and budding entrepreneurs in virtually every developing city were cashing in on the new country's growth. The Industrial Revolution was underway. And all of America was crowing about Slater and his wondrous mill, America's first, a factory. By 1820, 13 men, five women, and 52 children were turning 250 pound bales of cotton into a product for the national market. Yet for all his success, Slater's was a factory that produced only one product, yarn. Weavers and hand looms were still needed to produce cloth. Thus, the price of American cloth still couldn't compete with British textiles. 
With Europe engulfed in the Napoleonic Wars in the early 19th century, American ships bringing goods from the continent and England faced the dangers of being destroyed or seized by the warring powers. To keep the United States out of the European conflict, the Jefferson administration enacted an embargo in 1807, prohibiting the sailing of any American vessel to a foreign port. With American consumers denied access to British industrial products, the price of textiles skyrocketed. With no British imports to trade, a group of wealthy Boston merchants decided the time was right for getting into the textile business. A number of, of investors, particularly a group in Boston calling themselves the Boston Associates, some of the largest families of Boston, the Appletons, the Lowells, the Cabots, and others, the great merchant families, looked around and said, we need to diversify our portfolio. We've got too much of our money invested in shipping, and shipping can be sunk. Shipping can be lost at sea. Shipping can be boarded by French privateers. Shipping can be stopped by Jefferson's Embargo Act. We need to look for other investments for our capital. And one of them that looked attractive to them was the beginnings of the textile industry. An ideal site was found near the falls of the Merrimack River, 20 miles from Boston, Massachusetts. The group quickly raised the capital to buy the land and water rights. Their vision was for more than a factory, grander than a mere manufacturing plant. It would be an entire industrial community, controlled and governed by themselves. To support the system of envisioned factories, the group immediately ordered a series of locks and canals built. Immigrant workers were brought in to dig a network of channels to provide both power and transportation. In a sense, it was like the investors, as we might imagine them, planning a shopping mall. They would, they would get the land, uh, find the financing to build the mall, and then ultimately lease out the spaces that they have created in this mall to the various stores. Well, this is what they did in Lowell. They, in fact, built the dam, dug the canals, ran the power, and you said, well, gee, I'd like to have a, a textile mill. I think I'd like to have one right here. And they said, yeah, we'll put you right down here on this corner. We've got uh, so many horsepower of water right, delivered right to that site. So they initially were developers of land um, and only secondarily, many times, producers of cloth. The venture was America's most ambitious enterprise, a complete community, a utopia of industrial endeavors, all dedicated to one goal, the making of cloth. America's first industrial city was named Lowell. In contrast to Slater, Lowell is not only bigger, and more complex, but there's no longer the specialization that one had at Slater, or it was just one product. Indeed, Lowell operated like a well-oiled machine, taking cotton all the way from the bale to the bolt. The model that you're looking at is actually an example of one of the mill buildings in the 1830s. This integrated system with four floors of machines working really starts in the basement with the water coming in to power the equipment. And once you have the cotton coming into that first floor, it starts getting combed and brushed and stretched and twisted. So you've gone from the first floor to the second floor. And by the third floor, you're taking all of that yarn and you're combining onto large rolls. And you make it to the fourth floor where you take all of that yarn and you start weaving it into cloth. Just in this mill alone, there would have been over 200 people working on those machines. The mills pioneered the use of automation and assembly line techniques that would characterize virtually every other industry for the next century. The factories were filled with machines that represented the latest in technology. Raw cotton was taken first to the carding machines with its menacing rows of wire teeth. The new machines could comb an entire bale of cotton in a matter of minutes. This roll up here is going slowly and that's going fast. So it's pulling it off just like you're combing your hair. You're taking all the snarls and the lumps and bumps right out of it. And it's coming all the way along here until it gets down to this end. 
and then it's going to come off in the form of a long streamer like that. And in the olden days, they would hire boys and they would roll it together and make an endless piece out of it. And then that would be taken over and put on a spinning wheel and you'd put the spin in it and give the yarn the strength. The advanced machinery at Lowell could spin yarn many times faster than the older machines at Slater. But it was not just in spinning that Lowell's technology proved superior to that of its predecessor. The most technologically advanced machines of the mill were the power looms. While Slater's mill only made thread, Lowell's mills were filled with dozens of automated looms which wove cloth of all descriptions. Loud, monotonous, and unstoppable, for the human overseers, it was punishing work. All were unforgiving mechanical masters. To tend the machines, the Boston Associates hired thousands of young women, farm girls lured by a promise of a better life. By the mid-1800s, America's Industrial Revolution was running at full steam. The textile factories of Lowell were no exception. Business was booming, producing more cloth than anywhere in the nation. Its population had grown from 200 to 16,000. The town, a model for America's emerging industrial cities. Most of Lowell's citizens were young women, mill girls they were called. Many had traded their hard life on the family farm for the harsh life of the factory. Though wages were meager, hours were long, and the work was dangerous, at the time, America offered few opportunities for women. In North Anson, Maine, living on a farm that, you, that was three miles down a dirt road, and all the money you'd ever earn, milking cows or shucking corn, had really paid off bills in the general store under your father's account. Uh, and someone offered you a chance to leave town, live with other women, on your own and keep the money you earned. It's not a hard decision. You're out of there. The girls arrived by company coaches. On board, most new recruits felt they had risen above their station. On their own at last, a new life awaited. They came here expecting to work with people like themselves, for people who are also, they thought, like themselves, like their neighbors. They did not anticipate a hierarchical situation in which they were ordered about by overseers. Management controlled virtually every detail of the girls' lives. The factory bell told them when to eat and when to sleep, when to work and when to rest. Most lived in company-owned boarding houses, ruled by house mothers as strict as the factory boss. Poor attitude, improper behavior, even sickness, would all be written up and reported back to management. The girls all dined together and slept together. Each room had two beds shared by two girls each. Even church attendance was mandatory. Pew rent was deducted from their paychecks. Depending on skill and speed, mill girls earned from $185 to $3 per week. After subtracting $125 for weekly room and board, little was left for that dowry or the folks back home. The objective was to get the maximum amount of output and pay the minimum possible wage in order to keep your labor costs as low as possible. And very early on, the mill owners learned that there is nothing for holding down wages like a long line at the gate. To ensure a steady stream to the factory gates, mill owners aggressively recruited new girls. The factories even sponsored a journal, the Lowell Offering, which published glowing reports on the life in the mill city. The Lowell Offering is filled with stories of young women working to save the family farm from foreclosure. And there are all these stories of these almost saintly-like young women saving their money and sending every penny they pass possibly can back to their poor widowed mother on the farm. Tis evening, 
The glorious sun has sunk behind the western horizon. Gray twilight comes stealing over the landscape. The rattle of noisy wheels has ceased. All nature is at rest. But more realistic portrayals came from actual letters and diaries depicting a far different view. Whenever I raise the point that it is immoral to shut us up in a closed room 12 hours a day in the most monotonous and tedious employment, I am told that we have come to the mills voluntarily and we can leave when we will. A slave too goes voluntarily to his task, but his will is in some manner quickened by the whip of the overseer. The whip which brings us to Lowell is necessity. We must have money. There was no crack of the whip at Lowell, only the tolling of the factory bell. The thing that the young women remember most is the bell and the way the bell came to control their lives. All the machines have to run together. You can't start them and stop them on the whim of individuals. So the factory is a regimented environment in which everybody starts at the same time takes a break at the same time, quits at the same time, and it's sort of like basic training. You come to Lowell, you come to work when the bell rings. You don't leave till it rings again. As the 19th century progressed, the plight of the mill girls worsened. By the mid-1800s, they were forced to work an average of 75 hours a week. Wages were increasingly based on productivity. Each was assigned more machines, if a worker couldn't keep pace, she was harassed, or her wages slashed. Fatigue led to increased accidents. Women had to tie their hair back or put them in buns. Oftentimes they might become, you know, in, uh, caught up in the machine in either the belting or the uh, rolling rollers. In 1845, conflict between the mill girls and management came to a head. The women organized the Female Labor Reform Association and immediately began agitating for a 10-hour workday and improved conditions regarding the pace of work. It was the beginning of the end. The mill girls had had enough of Lowell's utopia and finally revolted. Right from the start, there were disagreements between the workers and the factory managers over virtually everything that went on in the factory. How long were they supposed to work? How hard were they supposed to work? What were they going to get paid? How regular was their work going to get? The workers quickly became the shock absorber in its economic system. Eventually, the workers in Lowell, even though they were respectable young women for whom such conduct was seen as improper, left the mills en masse and went into the streets to protest. The strikes didn't happen every day. They usually were not organized by unions, but they were strikes, uh, and in some cases involving hundreds and perhaps even thousands of women who walked out for several days in protest and, and drew the attention of newspapers all up and down the East Coast because it was such a dramatic, uh, unseemly thing for young women to engage in that kind of collective protest. Unwilling to give in to the girls' demands, mill management struck back and began hiring hundreds of newly arriving Irish immigrants. Poor and even more desperate for work, the immigrants offered the industry another class ripe for exploitation. Most of them come to this country with literally nothing but the, the clothes on their back. The mill owners quickly realized that and realized that these people could be worked harder. They could be worked longer hours. They could be forced to tend more machines. They could be forced to work machines running at higher speeds. And they would complain less because they had no, nothing to fall back on. They start to come into the Lowell Mills in large numbers. By the coming of the Civil War, close to one half of the workforce in Lowell is Irish immigrants. By the mid-1850s, the Lowell girls were gone, yet they left behind a legacy far more enduring than bolts of cloth. As the era came to a close, other more dramatic conflicts would take center stage, spinning the industry in new directions. The war between the states threatened to split the seam of America. Though the Confederate Army fought valiantly, they couldn't overcome the vast resources of the North. Iron and steel mills, offspring of the textile mills of New England, had made the Union a powerhouse of industrial might. The war laid waste to much of the South, 
But the ashes of defeat nourished new thinking, a belief that prosperity would return. A new South would rise, built on the foundation of industry. In the years after the Civil War, the South really became, for the first time, part of an integrated national economy. Uh, the 1870s, 80s, and 90s saw an enormous amount of railroad construction, bringing in access to national markets. The emancipation of the slaves, the collapse of plantation agriculture, required uh, southern businessmen, and planters have to be understood as businessmen, I mean, to start looking for new opportunities. These new national markets provided them uh, with those opportunities. Once again, as it had in England and the North, it was textiles which led the way. The shift of the American textile industry to the South didn't happen overnight. It was a process that took many years. But there are really four principal reasons why this occurred. Number one, you had a new transportation system that was available in the South in the years after the war. Number two, it was a lot closer to the source for the cotton. Number three, you had a captive labor force that had recently been forced off the land, poor farmers, scrapping for a living, looking for employment. And then number four, you had southern investors consumed with the idea of a new south, a south that would compete industrially with the north and looking to invest their money. The industry first took root in a wilderness country known as the Piedmont, a region extending across Virginia and the Carolinas into Georgia and Alabama. In the 1870s, the Piedmont was a rural, undeveloped land with few towns. Yet, with the advent of steam-powered machines, water power no longer offered advantages to textile mills. Instead, mill owners wanted markets desperate for work. When textile owners came looking for workers, the people of the Piedmont had little choice but trade the mule and plow for the spindle and loom. Adapting methods pioneered years earlier by Samuel Slater, Southern mill owners put the entire family to work. The first families to come off the farms to move into these mill villages and mill towns were usually families with um, a number of daughters because in the early days they used teenage female labor to, in the spinning rooms and they needed a lot of it. Uh, so the, for these families, moving to a mill village was a very attractive prospect. Instead of the rooster's crow, Families now woke to the wail of the factory whistle. Working conditions in these textile mills were, were indeed horrendous, certainly by modern standards. Sun up to sundown, 12 hour days, six days a week, sometimes six and a half days. Uh, the noise of these machines was overwhelming. Uh, certainly uh, this, there were tremendous safety issues as well in textiles when you came out of the mill, you often still had this cotton dust clinging to your hair, and that's how cotton mill workers came to be called lint heads. Uh, certainly a derogatory term in those days. Somebody, it was a way that the townspeople or people who made more money could stigmatize the working class. Ironically, by the early 20th century, the textile industry suffered from its own success. Newer technology allowed for vast increases in output. This output was easily absorbed during the First World War, but after hostilities ceased, an oversupply triggered lower prices and profits. The industry was trapped in a vicious cycle. Most owners felt wage rates must be reduced. The best way they could figure to cut labor cost was to intensify the pace of work on the shop floor. A weaver would be expected as a result of the stretch out to uh, supervise far more looms than he had supervised previously. Uh, same for a spinner. And here, all of a sudden, the employer was arbitrarily redefining what a fair day's work was. Even with increased hours, wage rollbacks, and stretch outs, many factories continued to be beset with the ironic problem of overproduction during the 1920s. 
the textile industry was desperate for a new vision, a new generation with fresh ideas. In 1919, just such a man arrived, Spencer Love. Educated at Harvard, Love passionately believed in modernizing the textile business. He believed a single company could dominate textiles like other corporations had controlled steel, chemicals, and automobiles. One of a group of self-designated progressive mill men, Love led the search for new solutions to the industry's age-old problems. With cotton at an all-time high and little to lose, Love decided to build a new mill in Burlington where modern production methods could be developed. In 1925, Love's Burlington Mills began experimenting with a new material, a man-made fiber. It was called rayon. If you think about the 1920s, the age of the flapper, I mean, the age of short skirts, when hemlines rise dramatically, it is rayon that in large degree makes this possible because it makes the modern sheer stocking possible for the first time. Love had struck it rich. Consumers stampeded for his artificial silk products. In especially high demand were the rayon dresses Love began manufacturing in 1928. To millions of women who had previously only dreamed on such luxuries, rayon was a miracle fabric. As profits rolled in, Love's income soared to close to $100,000 a year. But profits didn't trickle down. His typical employee still earned only $600. Ironically, Love's success only increased the disparity between mill owners and the workers in the mill villages. Many village residents grew alienated and resentful. While textile owners like Love once believed mill villages kept their workers safe from organized labor, in the 30s, the villages became pressure cookers of discontent. Neighborhood conversations and social gatherings became outlets for workers to express their frustrations. Some felt that they must make management aware of their plight. In Shelby, North Carolina, the local president of the United Textile Workers went to the mill operator's office, demanding a 25% raise for residents of the community. Management responded, you are not going to get any 25% raise. We will shut down and order the hands to move. Mill owners then as now are adamantly anti-union. Uh, they did not want workers uh, gaining any particularly independent power uh, to shape the workplace. Southerners, especially the adult male heads of households, were your basic Southern good old boys. Uh, not the sort of people who were willing to allow themselves to be pushed terribly much. So mill owners had a very, very careful, delicate balance to maintain. In September 1934, the rage and despair that had been simmering for generations boiled to the surface. The leaders of the United Textile Workers Union called for a general strike. It was the largest single labor conflict in American history. 400,000 workers walked off their jobs. This was at a time at the beginning of the New Deal when President Roosevelt was putting together various New Deal programs for each of the industries. And the textile workers felt in particular that they were getting a raw deal. So they called a general strike. And even though Southern workers weren't unionized, weren't known for their labor solidarity, they joined in this general strike and, and made it in a particularly effective statement. In September, the governors of North and South Carolina called out the National Guard, 14,000 troops to quell impending bloodshed. Roadblocks were set up, picket lines formed. There was violence and bloodshed. At one mill in Honeapath, seven strikers were killed when pro-management and union forces clashed. Some who survived the battle were crippled for life. In Burlington, National Guardsmen bayoneted both male and female strikers. Still, management held firm. Spencer Love and other mill owners refused to negotiate. Realizing the power of the mill operators to replace them with modern equipment or other unemployed workers, strikers began to lose faith in the union. 
when a depression comes along, unemployment goes way up, workers have very little bargaining power with a boss. If a group of workers in a union say, well, go on and strike, the boss will say, go on and strike. There are thousands of unemployed workers around the factory. I'll just pick them up and train them in a few days and replace you guys. As picket lines dispersed, mill owners emerged as clear victors. The workers' attempts to better their conditions were in vain. The sound of looms was heard once again in the valleys and hills of the Piedmont. An era in labor history was coming to a close. Like the Lowell girls before them, southern textile workers had found that their power to win concessions from management through labor agitation was limited. In the coming decades, the American textile industry would be transformed, not by strikes and clashes between management and labor, but by the forces of global war and advances in technology. For America's once troubled textile industry, the decades of the 40s and 50s were golden. Driven by huge military orders and a rapidly growing civilian economy, the industry expanded dramatically through the war years and beyond. In the 1950s, Americans settled comfortably into new suburbs and began to have children in record numbers. It was the baby boom, and the textile industry prospered as never before. As America moved into the 60s, the very fabric of society was being transformed by great social forces. During the decade, the textile industry was also forced to transform itself in order to keep up with rapidly changing consumer tastes. But by the end of the 60s, the go-go years of the textile industry began to wind down. And in the 70s and 80s, many feared the industry might not survive the challenges that lay ahead. For many, many years, several hundred years, uh, there was the development of small breakthroughs and improvements and speeds and so forth. But after World War II, another tremendous revolution took place. Machinery manufacturers of um, Germany and then uh, Japan uh, started with very, very low labor costs. They had uh, many brilliant engineers working in the industry um, who built new machinery for new plants and um, totally revolutionized the way fabric was woven and the way yarns that went into fabric was, was spun. With Europe and Japan armed with superior technology and far lower labor costs, American companies seem to face a grim future. We have seen the textile industry thriving on cheap labor. Uh, in the 19th century, uh, it was the labor of New England mill girls and later immigrants. Uh, in the late 19th century South, uh, it was the labor supplied uh, by men, women, and children from hard scrabble farms in the Carolina Piedmont and the Smokies. Nowadays, it's the cheap labor uh, you know, of India, of Southeast Asia, uh, of Latin America, perhaps even Africa. To survive, the American textile industry had to change and adapt. In the 90s, America's strength in computers and technology enabled the industry to begin to beat back foreign competitors and again emerge as a global textile leader. It's very easy to be pessimistic about the future of the American textile industry. But let's remember that the American textile industry does have some strengths. It is located here in the wealthiest market in the world. So it is close to its market. It can understand its market and react to it very quickly. We also have some of the most modern equipment in the world in American mills. So now many textile companies have developed very innovative strategic alliances and partnerships so innovative relationships like that can, can stem the tide, can uh, help bring about a, a much more positive in, uh, future for the American textile industry. Today, because of huge investment, of about $2 billion a year over the last 10 years, we are a very competitive industry and find ourselves in a position where we can export more and compete in other markets as well as our own market. 
Today, the U.S. textile industry stands at a crossroads. While work conditions and wage rates are better than they have ever been before, fewer Americans are employed in the mills. Still, the technology that has displaced so many has allowed the industry to survive. American business has always had to adapt to challenges. From Samuel Slater's using British techniques to make Moses Brown's mill competitive, to the development of the first industrial city at Lowell, to the movement of textile manufacturing to the south, and finally, to today's computer-driven machines. Change has been the one constant in the nation's rise to industrial greatness. But those pioneers who began it all remain woven into the tapestry of American enterprise. The spinning wheel and loom, engines of change, machines that started a revolution that changed history and the very fabric of a nation.